in yep. case I leave halfway through. Perfect. All right. <laughs> okay. Well, welcome everybody to the Alternative Fruits webinar series. Um, I believe this is maybe our fifth in the series. We've got one more coming to you this fall. And I'm just now putting that link in the chat where you can see previously recorded webinars as well as registration for our final webinar on October 21st. So that is in the chat for everyone. Well, just kidding. Now it's in the chat for everyone. Okay. Um, and today our topic is alternative bush and berry crops to boost your bank account. And our speaker is Dr. Brian Smith with the University of Wisconsin. Um, and before he gets started, just a couple other things to mention. If you do have questions, feel free to enter them into the chat or the Q&A box. I will be keeping an eye on both of those uh, as our speaker is presenting. Um, if topics or questions brought up are relevant to the topic he's speaking on, I'll go ahead and interrupt and ask. Otherwise, we will wait and to do questions at the end of the presentation. So again, thank you all for joining us. I will stop sharing and have Brian go ahead and share his screen. Are you able to share your screen with us, Brian? Should okay. be working now, right? Yep, it's... Perfect, there we go. All right, well, welcome everybody. And uh, I really appreciate uh, being uh, able to talk about some of these new fruit crops that are available to the public. And uh, these alternative berry crops that uh, will boost your bank account, hopefully, are uh, new in our area, but uh, certainly have been around actually as native plants, most of them for a long time. And in fact, many plants have been, uh, species have been grown over and taken over to Europe and grown commercially before we actually get to grow them here. So, um, one of the things that we notice is that uh, these new plants are really in the news and uh, that means honeyberries and elderberries and Saskatoon berries. And uh, basically, if you uh, look at your screen from the standpoint of uh, all these different uh, sources of news, uh, elderberries and all these have their health components that have really uh, been a big boon during the pandemic. So there's been even special segments on uh, TV, like in the Twin Cities. Here, here's a little bit on uh, the elderberry uh, entitled The Little Berry That Could and talking about all the products that we have available uh, from elderberries. And uh, the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture talks about specialty crop opportunities. So um, these are all um, crops that uh, I decided to talk about, the uh, elderberries and uh, juneberries and hascaps, just because I saw the economic potential. There were other crops I was going to talk about today, but they turned out not to be as economically feasible as once I had, had I once thought. So one of the questions that comes to mind is which people are trying new things. And generally it's small diversified farms that are located near urban areas and you can define urban areas any way you want. Um, they do retailing or value added processing. Lots of organic farmers are interested Farmers who see traditional commodities becoming increasingly unprofitable, at least from the way they're growing them. And remember, don't uh, always discount a particular crop unless you have already tried maybe a different way of growing them to make them more profitable, like in a, a hoop house or something. And those with the entrepreneurial spirit. So you have to question yourself, first of all, why are you growing the fruit? And hopefully for this uh, seminar, it's to make money. And you want to know how much money? Well, we'll go through that. 
So why would we want to choose a less mainstream crop? It, well, it so happens that most of them uh, tend to be a little bit more tolerant of adverse climate. And uh, that means the extremes brought about by global climate change. And one of the things that we notice the most is the extremes in temperature. And one thing I've seen is a lot of these, uh, our crops are starting out earlier in the spring, but then we still have late spring frosts. And just about all these crops that I'm talking about either bloom late and or have uh, resistance or very high tolerance to spring frost during bloom time. When you choose one of these crops, there's going to be less competition from other growers and markets. And uh, depending on the situation, most of these can even out your labor uh, that you have and uh, hopefully enable you to have more permanent uh, uh, long term labor on hand that's easier to uh, maintain than trying to always worry about getting seasonal labor. While diversification can be a major contributor to successful farm operations, especially effective when we're talking about crops that can be direct marketed on farm or at farmers markets. And uh, one thing we uh, certainly look at on uh, all three of these crops is the potential for processing and mechanical harvesting. So you may have to uh, think about uh, group ownership of equipment like mechanical harvesters that come to be pretty expensive. Doesn't mean that we can't do hand harvesting. All three are amenable to that, but uh, mechanical harvesting is another uh, option. And uh, you know, those of us that are organically inclined, well, you may be forced to in this case because there's not as many pesticides that are labeled for use in these uh, minor crops. So registration of uh, crop protectants is lagging behind the interest. And so we are talking about diversification into the unknown where no human has gone before. Well, not quite, but sometimes close. Uh, we've got uh, most of these are suggested alternative crops that are being grown elsewhere on earth right now. So when we look at new crop adoption, we are already have addressed the adaptability to climate, but also these all three crops are going to be adapted to many different types of soils, unlike crops like blueberries, mainstream crops like blueberries. They uh, are sustainable because there's been a fair amount of research done on these. They're marketable and they're compatible with the most existing equipment that uh, we might have on hand as already commercial fruit growers. And uh, we always considering a new crop, we wanna do a new budget and we wanna do a SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So here's just an example of an elderberry grower with SWOT analysis and potential strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And I will mention along the way here again, we have a lot of slides and a lot of information on some of these slides. So it's great to listen to these recordings and look at these slides in more depth than we have time today so that you can uh, take in the full value of them. So, the four P's of marketing, product, placement, price, and promotion are certainly always things to uh, keep in mind when we're uh, looking at new crops. And we certainly don't want to plant anything unless we know where we're going to sell it. And if we're looking at uh, farmers markets, here's some suggestions on uh, looking at a market in more detail for farmers markets. Some questions to explore with these new crops. How do I get into that market? What are the costs and what are the prices going to be? And uh, what do you have to buy to need the business, need for my business and for what price? Is the supply I need readily available? Who are the customers? Quantifying the customers is a big deal with demographics. 
And what can I do differently from my competitors? And then there's a whole host of value added products in all three of these crops I'm going to talk about. And when we look at a market segment, we've got to have a target market in mind. Is that farmer's market? Is it online market? Well, then we look at the demographic characteristics and the psychographic characteristics like lifestyle, behavior, values, and attitudes. And then we decide on what products to produce from our uh, fruit crops. And we identify who wants that product and uh, what conditions under which they will buy it. And then we formulate the marketing strategies to meet the needs of the target market. Here's just an example of elderberry jelly market segments and uh, taking a look at online customers geographically and health food stores customers. So you can read some of those. And the traditional and uh, uh, avenues for market channels for these crops, we have all pretty much started with pick your own or pre-picked on farm, but then we're looking at uh, lots of opportunities for value added products, getting premium prices at farmers markets or looking at greater acreage selling wholesale or a combination of any of the above. How do we locate and draw our customers? Well, here's a whole host of different opportunities that uh, you may or may not have thought about to uh, draw attention to your uh, product and draw in customers. And don't forget, uh, Minnesota has similar things as Wisconsin, but the local food marketing guide, you want to be listed in there and make sure that you're part of something special from Wisconsin. These are all ways to identify for people to identify you that are going on vacation, want to find a particular type of product and where you're located. And there are research components to all these new crops. And remember the horticultural aspects are like, can we spray it, propagate it, and pick it? What are the economics? And what are the product development opportunities? Are there health benefits? Can we process? And what kind of quality variation would there be in this crop? And I used to have this as the top 10 mistakes made by beginning growers, but I've made it 11. And uh, you can read through most of them, but I've highlighted some of the ones that I see all the time. Failure to assess market details and the customer base and how to reach them. Ignoring other crops, which I've already mentioned, like the mainstream crops of strawberries, blueberries, and raspberries. And assuming the crop chosen is trouble-free. Now, I've said, well, these crops that we're talking about are tough and they're adapted to temperature extremes. They're winter hardy, but that does not mean they're trouble free. And of course, the more you grow them, the more you see that of any crop. Planting too many acres before acquiring the skills. So we want to start small. A lot of growers, especially in rural areas, and yes, that is a uh, definitely a difficulty being in more rural areas, but where prices typically have to be cheaper, but underpricing is a major one. And then my favorite one that I added, the itchy planting syndrome. This is where the grower is aching to get started inadequate site prep. In other words, not really getting rid of the perennial weeds prior to planting. They want to plant now without irrigation, without a deer fence, or any research on cultivars, or maybe they even have their plants already uh, ordered from the nursery and they haven't done anything else. So poor site prep, 
and planning guaranteed that you will compound your original mistakes many times over the years. So do it right the first time. You'll be happy. So why do we want to irrigate? That's a major part of all this. And again, a lot of growers seem to think the, the bigger stature the crop, the less they need irrigation. Not true, especially at the uh, establishment period, which uh, for many of these is three or four years. But in uh, droughts and uh, off years, which seems to be every year now, <laughs> it's good to have irrigation. It's an insurance policy might be one of the most expensive things you have to invest in, but it's the most easily recoverable cost. And we're gonna look at enterprise budgets and those enterprise budgets are gonna be a good tool for us to make decisions on how to make our crop production more efficient. And here's a review. Okay, so here are the crops we're going to go over in kind of reverse order, I believe. We're going to start out with elderberries, then hascaps, then juneberries or saskatoons. Most uh, all of these have many health benefits, but great flavors in many products, kind of like aronia. I didn't talk about aronia today because I've done so much, uh, many presentations on aronia. But don't forget them. But you know, it's a good example of a crop that is, uh, you know, got not so great flavor to eat out of hand. But once it's in a processed product or baked goods, they're amazing. And elderberries, all parts of the plant are actually somewhat poisonous and uh, break down into cyanide. So these have to be definitely cooked and put into uh, processed products. So where is commercial production of these crops? Well, for Saskatoon's, Canada is the primary, but there's some starting in Poland and other European areas. And we have probably around 100 acres in the US in Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and New York. Honeyberry, Russia, some in Europe, and greatly increasing in Canada, and certainly a lot of uh, young operators in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan and out east in New York. Elderberries, considerable amount in Europe, some in Canada and a few in the US and Missouri and Maine and a few other places, Vermont. So when we look at these crops, here's Canadian dollars. And of course, uh, right uh, now it's about 0.79 conversion rate from Canadian to US uh, currency. But in 2019, hascaps were already worth over $2 million, as were Saskatoon berries. Elderberries were uh, definitely in the other fruit category, so we don't have any specifics on them. So let's start out with elderberries. And uh, they have been used for many, many centuries and uh, in uh, all across the world for medicinal use. And the market potential is uh, great because all parts of the plant can be used and they have fruit have high antioxidant levels and uh, the flowers are used in wine and uh, they are many non-alcoholic beverages and alcoholic beverages. Lots of baked goods, jellies, jams, and uh, certainly a dietary supplement for cold and flu remedies. There's significant potential for U.S. growing elderberries. Uh, there's 30,000 acres in Europe. Missouri leads the U.S. with over 350 acres. But Maine has the largest producer of certified organic elderberries. And uh, a lot of this elderberry starts with uh, university systems and uh, their extension people doing research and promoting these crops. And here's just an example of the uh, different benefits and potential benefits of elderberries and their sources of this activity. 
And just to give you some idea, prices range from three to five dollars a pound for uh, fresh at farmers markets, dried elderberry. Um, we have as a food or supplement ingredient, it's already a hundred thirteen million dollar value in the U.S. in 2019. These are all from a Florida publication, and elderberry ranked tenth in uh, functional ingredients in the natural food group. And elderberry sales grew 83% from 2018 to 2019. And uh, then a little bit more specific, if we look at US 790 acres were reported by the USDA in 2017. And if you really want to start looking at what products are being made and how they're distributed by the big players in the market, these are the global elderberry market uh, constituents. And if you're uh, looking at sharing resources, there are cooperatives and lots of institutes out there that are uh, helpful have good websites and lots of information to help get you started. And uh, there are, even in Minnesota, the uh, Midwest Elderberry Cooperative is uh, really been pushing things along for elderberries in the upper Midwest. Well, here's a, uh, for a uh, typical three acre elderberry orchard, these are some of the investments we might have to look at for uh, that crop. And I'm gonna just kind of move through here because you can look through these in detail. And uh, then the plant propagation of elderberry is uh, definitely can be done by growers you can do your own, but of course, uh, propagation is a kind of an interesting and somewhat uh, involved process, even with simple cuttings. But you want to make sure you start out with mother plants that are supposedly disease free from a good nursery. But uh, you remember, cannot propagate anything with a current patent on it. Elderberries are propagated either by softwood or hardwood cutting. And here's just some examples of some uh, cultivars that are in the uh, early mid-season and unknown ripening periods. A lot of these are quite old cultivars. I should note at this time that there's uh, some from uh, Missouri that have some very impressive stats, but we're not sure whether they're completely hardy up here yet like Marge and Wildwood and some of those. And here's a little bit more in-depth description of those cultivars. And if you want to look at some sources of elderberry plants, here's some very in-depth information that I found for those uh, elderberries that are certainly going to be available with um, different uh, sources in the United States. Sorry about uh, the music here. <laughs> okay, and here's some other sources, Fedco Seeds, Northern Norse Nursery. We, a lot of people know about that. Stark Brothers Nursery and Walden Heights Nursery. By the way, these are some uh, Missouri cultivars here with a more upright panicle and a more drooping panicle. The birds don't seem to like the drooping panicles quite as much. And then here's just a uh, some information I downloaded from another nursery that you can take a look at. Young elderberry establishment is kind of like any other uh, types of uh, information uh, or fruit crops that we grow. We wanna do perennial weed control. We wanna have full sun. They are adapted to a wide range of soils. And if they're in a spot where there's a poor water drainage, you can grow them up on berms. And there's your spacing suggested. 
I would suggest the landscape mulch and then have a uh, or landscape fabric with mulch on top for establishment of elderberries. And here's some examples of some young elderberries established. They, uh, you want to make sure you have permanent viable alleys with, uh, and we want to establish low mole hard fescues or a dwarf winter hardy perennial ryegrass for those alleyways uh, that will help you whether you're uh, doing any kind of an operation, including machine harvesting. Elderberry nutrition. Some examples of information there to bring it up to uh, what we want pre-plant and then post-plant. And then there are some standards set for plant tissue analysis. And in case you thought elderberries were free of pests, guess what? Here's a whole long list. And one of the most recent one is tomato ring spot virus. Although Missouri researchers uh, seem to think even with a pretty heavy virus load, they didn't see too many uh, problems with the uh, uh, performance of their plants. And uh, everything from Japanese beetle to spotted wing drosophila can get into those uh, fruit. Elderberry pruning, probably not much for the first two years, but uh, typical thinning out and uh, trying to get uh, six to 10 canes of different ages, uh, one and two years old, uh, or up to three years old. Some growers are mowing off annually or biannually every other year, but it makes the harvest later, but you have uh, fewer signs, but much larger signs. Elderberry harvest is going to be uh, from mid-June to mid-July for flowers and berries ripen in mid-August to mid-September. And an estimate harvest average of five bushes per hour if you have pickers and assuming an average of 4.46 pounds of berries per bush results in a harvest rate of 22 pounds of berries per hour per picker. Elderberry yields year one, you might get something the year after planting. And these are actually Missouri cultivars here, Gordon and Wildwood. Older cultivars, uh, 12 to 15 pounds per plant, upwards of 14,000 pounds per acre by year three. And uh, fairly low bricks, fairly low pH, titratable acidity are there. If you're looking at big going into processing, you're going to want to have a destemming machine. There are some different ones that have been developed out there. In fact, River Falls Harvest, uh, Hills Harvest, uh, TED sells for $8,500. Got a three bay sink and can process several hundred pounds of berries per hour, but it needs four people to attend. And I'm going to skip most of this because the bottom line the slide is on slide 71, but this is uh, something that you can look through in detail on unit cost per unit from year one all the way from year three to 20. So we'll skip through these, but at least you have them on hot hand for the recording. And these are all from my uh, University of Florida. And then the pack out of number one berries versus number two berries. And then the flower pack out, variable harvest costs for labor. And here's the budget summary for mature elderberry orchard for uh, revenues, operating costs. And then here's the bottom line, annual production margin per acre. Wow, that's like processing, some processing vegetable crops, but not even as good as that. So we have to take this with a grain of salt though, because there are 
opportunities to look at some uh, other manufacturing and processing potential and labor issues. So if the orchard owner or family manage without extra labor, they can return $7,252 in cost per acre that goes back to net return. If growers can have effective marketing, they're going to get higher prices. Profitability depends on partly finding efficiencies, and there's a rising demand. So here's another example from uh, the Vermont uh, Guide for Growing Elderberries. And uh, total establishment investment, about 23000 annual operating expense of about 6,000. But if we look at that, price per pound at $4, price per pound $3 and $2, here's where your break evens are and return on investment. Yield only three and three quarter pounds per bush, gonna take you 53 years. But if you get 15 pounds per bush, only four years and net income starting in year three, 21,000, okay? So here's a summary for five acres at $4 a pound, the return on investment is gonna hit in uh, eight years. And then different uh, scenarios were 40 bushes or one acre or five acres. And then if we go into processed products, number of bottles and uh, finished products at elderberry extract, total value added expense, $6,200. But if you start looking at different size runs, you may be able to make some very good profit. And then uh, there are plenty of online tools for elderberry decision making. So you can uh, put in all your own figures for these online tools and figure out your own budget. Or you can do it by hand. And if we look at some of the uh, different sources of uh, cooperatives, Here's the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri, and uh, then Minnesota Elderberry Cooperative, Norms Farms. These are all good places for information and uh, some uh, contacts. And here's another example of a uh, source of uh, different types of uh, information for elderberry production. And they came up with Ontario Ministry of Agriculture about $2,000 per acre. And at a year three, they were breaking even. Okay, let's move on to has caps. We're gonna try to move through this quite quickly, but interesting, here's the uh, source of the name has cap uh, from Hokkaido, Japan. And it's from the Ainu people that have haskapu, which means little presence at the end of branches. Hey, that's pretty appropriate, huh? So has caps are also known as blue honeysuckles, sweetberry honeysuckle, and twinberry honeysuckle. Their native range is quite extensive, but there's quite a bit of difference amongst the uh, indigenous sources geographically. And we could call these centers of origin, of course, but most of the best are from uh, Japan and Russia. Now, again, you see this same uh, slide you've seen before, and there's our has caps at uh, $2 million, $2.3 million value in 2019 in Canada. And just so we uh, can have it straight as to the latitude and seasonal comparisons, whether you're in Oregon, Connecticut, Canada, Japan, Poland, 
the UK or New Zealand? So here's the uh, horticultural information that we uh, look at and also dietary information. Uh, fruit is higher in antioxidants or these are going to be anti-cancer compounds than blueberries. The flowers are tolerant to spring frost down to 15 to 17 degrees, but they are very early blooming, at least the Russian types. They're the first fruit of the spring. They're extremely winter hardy. They are a member of the honeysuckle family. They will bear well in the fourth year. They have an extremely long lifespan. In fact, in Russia, there's some uh, that have lasted 150 years, one bush. So what does honeyberry taste like? Their flavor is like tart, sweet, and juicy with a melt in your mouth effect. Some describe it as a cross between blueberry, raspberry, and black currant, and uh, color similar to blueberry, of course. And they have their own distinctive look because every cultivar is a little bit different shape and lots of tasty baked goods and ice cream, pies and tarts, fresh. So there is real potential in the Midwest uh, for pick your own farms or selling at farmer's market. They are very winter hardy, like we said. They're uh, well-drained soils of pH five to eight. Within row spacing should be two and a half to four feet apart within row for a hedge row and four to six feet apart within row for mechanical harvest. Between row spacing is about 16 feet for mechanical harvest, but down to eight to 10 feet for pick your own. They do like full sun, like most fruit crops, and uh, they are tolerant of a lot of different uh, soil types. And uh, so the Russians say when you uh, plant a hazcap, you will not only be able to enjoy it for your, yourself, your children, grandchildren, and probably even your great-grandchildren. So here's a timeline for berry yield. Again, year three is when they kind of start and you're gonna be doing it by harvest by hand. And then you start having the opportunity for machine by probably around year five or six. And one of the things that we have noted is that you wanna start with fairly large size plants, two to four gallon potted plants, nothing like liners because they just don't establish or take off well out in the field. Here's some examples of some cultivars that have been released uh, primarily by the University of Saskatchewan at Saskatoon. Most recent ones are Boreal Blizzard, Boreal Beauty, and Boreal Beast. And then from other sources uh, from Nova Scotia, Here's some of the different uh, 2015 to 2017 uh, favorites for cooler zones and warmer zones. And some of these do include some of the uh, cultivars released by Maxine Thompson, uh, I believe in Oregon. And here's just an example of a, uh, I believe this is Tundra. Sorry, I can't see the headings on these and I'm not quite sure um how to get this removed but i don't want to take the chance on it right now and here's just an example of all the different shapes of uh different cultivars of uh different aspects. and here's uh different shapes sorry again and here's an article that I wrote uh, in a newsletter, Wisconsin newsletter, and these are sources of honeyberry, and yes, there are some in the U.S. And uh, everything from Arkansas to Minnesota to uh, California and Missouri. And the last of those. 
And then uh, one thing to mention is that there are some uh, honey berries that were developed by Maxine Thompson, which I mentioned earlier. And she, uh, she is now uh, passed away, but she did, she was very productive in her breeding program and solo Maxi and Yesberries are all uh, have some uh, good potential. Zone 3A to 7B USDA hardiness zone. The uh, the hascaps do need pollinizers. So the ratio should be about one to three to one to six, depending on the cultivar. They do bloom early in April and May. So sometimes it's hard to get bees at that time, but bees are required. Uh, I would guess with this type of flower, I haven't seen too much literature, but I would think bumblebees should work pretty well. Honeybees don't like uh, cooler weather at that time of year. Sometimes the hives are not available, but uh, possibly we should look into uh, mason bees and so, some other option too for uh, pollinators. And here's just a chart for uh, pollinizer uh, compatibility and also bloom time of different cultivars. And then uh, the pest problems are few. Uh, both diseases and insects. Uh, one of the most uh, obvious ones is powdery mildew if you've got poor air circulation on young plants, but plenty of, uh, you know, mice and gopher problems, uh, spotted wing drosophila, but birds are the primary concern and you want netting that is going to be less than or equal to a half inch in size. Cedar wax wings are one of the worst. Here's a powdery mildew on the uh, honeyberry. Pruning is typically minimal, minimal in the first several years. New canes and shoots arise from the base and renewal pruning may be necessary on older bushes. Prune out weak and crossing stems like you would in any kind of a bush fruit. Wanna do it in late winter? and never remove more than 25% of the bush. Luckily, hascaps don't sucker like uh, some of the other plants like uh, service berry or uh, Saskatoons. And you may need to uh, get rid of lower branches and train the bushes more upright if you're doing mechanical harvesting. And here's just a slide showing how much was removed from this a plant, it doesn't look a lot different from before and after, but there was a fair amount of wood taken off of this particular plant. Yields and harvest are gonna be uh, near six pounds per bush and can be up to over 15 pounds uh, per bush. Color must develop throughout the fruit for harvest. Uh, so it's just like blueberries. You can't have that pink at the petals land. You wanna have the uh, fruit, you, just like a blueberry, you gotta have it colored throughout. And here's just an example of uh, when you would be looking at harvesting different fruit crops, including the hascaps whether it be the uh, University of Saskatchewan, the Russians, the Japanese, or the Kirill varieties from Japan, uh, and uh, then various other fruit crops. And here's just a uh, little bit that I took from Honeyberry USA, where they not only sell plants, but they also do uh, you pick and uh, pre-picked. So just some interesting information there. Hand harvest, a picker can harvest six and a half to an 11 pounds per hour. So cost per pound for hand harvest is about a dollar to a dollar 20 uh, and uh, $9,000 per acre. And uh, there are some unique ways of doing some easier harvest by shaking the fruit into an umbrella for individual plants or machine harvesting, of course, but you certainly want bird protection.
The Russian hybrids tend to have more uniform harvesting. They're determinate. So they're great for mechanical harvesting, but many of the Japanese types tend to have uneven harvesting. So they'd uh, be more likely to be for pick your own or uh, fresh uh, farm sales on farm sales. There is a specific machine, the Oxbow Corvan 9000 that's preferred and the harvest speed is about a mile per hour. So it can do up to 10 acres a day and uh, it's economically feasible at 10 acres for one harvester and uh, and one harvester is used for a 40 acre orchard self-propelled new costs around 150,000 with smaller tractor drawn versions running about 75,000 but there's also in places like Washington state you can rent for $3,500 per 400 hours And here's just showing some different harvesters. Straddle harvesters, over the row harvesters, and some unique shapes in the honeyberry. And I only have uh, one source of uh, budgets for honeyberry from Alberta. It's from their growing uh, manual. So net income on year eight, and this is on a per acre basis, they're looking at almost $16,000. So that's pretty darn good. And here's the, uh, I had uh, looked at this and decided to blow it up a little bit. So uh, hand harvest 16,000 or machine harvest 7,000 net income by year eight. And of course, you don't break even until about year four there, because prior to that, you are in the red. And then here's uh, some uh, listing of equipment and inputs that you would on a per acre basis. And there are all kinds of associations already. Uh, HASCAP Canada Association, and uh, then there's British Columbia HASCAP Association, there's an Ontario Growers Association, and uh, we even have some starting up in the U.S. And uh, HASCAP Growers of Alberta. And just in case you want to uh, talk to some actual growers. I threw in some farms here in their contact information. Hopefully they won't mind, but uh, I'm sure they wouldn't. If you're that far away, it'd be kind of cool to call some of these people up and uh, see what they think about their crop. And here's some more. All right, let's finish out with the uh, Saskatoons. And I know we should be uh, quitting here very shortly. I'll take a couple of extra five minutes. We do want to have this all wrapped up for at least uh, five to 10 minutes of questions. Saskatoons to me seem to be one of the more viable of the three along with HASCAPs. They're growing on almost 900 farms in Canada. Their early season was self-fertile frost hardy flowers. 45 to 60 days post bloom for harvest. It's a medium large shrub, tolerate a large range of soil conditions from sand to silty clay, but not tolerant of poorly drained soils. And there are several different species, but primarily it's Amelancure alnifolia. And there's your derivation for the name Saskatoon. Here's a picture of Saskatoon commercial production in Canada. And here's your slide again. There's your Saskatoon berries at over $2 million value in Canada in 2019. And breaking it down by province, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba. Economics in Canada. 4,000 acres, 24 million per year in US dollars. 
Uh, they're pick your own at $2 a pound, $3 a pound fresh or mechanical harvest. Establishment cost $2,000 per acre and 3,000 to 4,000 net return per year, eight to 10 years to pay back, return on investment. And some great fruit characteristics compared to blueberries, strawberries, and raspberries. High antioxidant or anti-cancer levels measured by ORAC. Michigan has about 50 growers all level already at the hobby level or above, less than 100 acres of bearing plants, but uh, pest control is a challenge. I think probably because they, since Saskatoon's are a palm fruit related to apples, that um, there's a fair number of pests out there, not overwhelming, but it is a challenge when you got so many fruit crops like in Michigan. The growers are successfully marketing at uh, fresh fruit on farm and farmers markets and also Saskatoon products. <clears throat> it is native to the upper Midwest. Cornell University did a uh, study on acceptance through their uh, Northeast Sustainable Ag Research and Education Program. They uh, interviewed, uh, surveyed 1,500 customers, consumers at a three-day ag expo. They found most consumers in the study liked the flavor, nutrition, or combination of flavor and nutrition of Saskatoons. Many consumers presume the flavor to be the same and find Juneberries to taste like a bland blueberry. Some consumers felt the flavor experience with Juneberries is superior to blueberries and expressed a preference for Juneberries. And here's all the products. Everything from ice cream to baked goods to beverages to wine to cider to jam. And some of the Juneberry cultivars. And I scanned uh, lots of different sources for information. And guess what? Montana State University did a replicated performance trial and just ended in 2020. So here's how they performed at the Western Egg. I think it was at Bozeman. And then propagation of June berries is either by softwood cuttings and more recently, seems like tissue culture is catching on. These are eight week old plants propagated in vitro or in test tube or like micro propagation. Sources of June berry plants, Saskatoons have mixed buds, just like apples and pears. They do have vegetative buds also. Here's vegetative buds, which are smaller and more slender. The mixed buds have both flower and vegetative parts within, and they're more plump. And the Saskatoon has a reduced panicle with florets, florets opening from the top to the bottom. They're adapted to a wide range of environmental conditions. They believe five acres is the minimum size for machine harvested commercial orchards. Very frost tolerant flowers that even in Michigan, they get a 50% crop when apple and cherry crops fail entirely. They like well-drained soils, want a slight slope to the Northeast to uh, help avoid frost. And we do need weed control and irrigation as a must, like in every fruit crop, but especially during establishment years. Hi, Brian, we've got about five minutes or so left for questions. Okay, so I'm gonna just do a few more slides and then we'll turn it over to questions. How does that sound? Sounds good. All right. Deep planting is one of the things that is a potential benefit in that you can get less surface suckering and uh, get more of the plant to come up with shoots from the base. So that's a new uh, innovation. Here's some uh, actually mature and young, mature plantings and young plantings of Saskatoon. Nutrition is there for you to take a look at fertilizing, 
pests and plenty of uh, mammals also besides the uh, birds being a problem. Here's uh, some good information on pruning. We want a vase shaped. And for uh, harvest, definitely keep in mind that customers judge their satisfaction with a few pick operation by quality of fruit, ease of picking, friendliness of staff, aesthetics of the orchard, proximity of the orchard to home. And here's just some uh, commercial uh, harvesting with uh, mechanical harvesters. And uh, 98 to 100% effectiveness of fruit picking on these harvesters, pretty impressive. And then uh, the Alberta source for uh, the budgetary information, I've summarized this and basically uh, by year 10 on 10 acres, $229,000 uh, net. Okay, so here's accumulated return. So you're in the red until year six. And uh, that comes out to about $23,000 of average income per year up to year 10. And then we look at uh, Saskatoon orchards uh, seem to be very uh, favorable in uh, all the uh, studies that I've seen. Very good opportunity. And there are Saskatoon berry uh, institutes and uh, associations. And there's my contact information. Thank you very much. We'll turn it over and uh, we'll take some questions. Excellent. Thank you, Brian. Um, I'm in the Q&A box and we have a comment that came in actually before the talk officially started from Bridget um, and just mentioned that she was in the Ag Station in Corvallis, uh, Montana, and they have about 18 varieties of Haskap, a Saskatoon and five or six uh, elderberries. And then we have another comment uh, that Saskatoons are quite sensitive to 2,4-D drift. Have you experienced that as well, Brian? That is very true and uh, just almost as bad as grapes. So we really have to be careful where 2,4-D is banned in California because of all our valuable uh, fruit crops. It's not in Wisconsin. So you want to be upwind of uh, somebody using 2,4-D or make sure that you know the person and convey uh, your neighbor that it's very important to that uh, they try, hopefully try something else and certainly use the amine form, not the ester form. Excellent, thank you. Uh, if there's any other questions, they can be an, um, an entered into the Q&A box or the chat box. And I will not see anything. Or if you wanna raise your hand, that's another function and I can unmute you if that's easier as well. I'm not seeing anything else come in. I, what I will do is I will go ahead and put the link in again to the chat for everyone um, to access the recording of this webinar as well as previous webinars. Oh, looks like we've got something. So in the chat, you can access previously recorded webinars as well as this one once it's posted. And we've got a question from Chuck that says, many farmers I've talked to have been a bit skeptical of the economic potential. Should people be skeptical? Should always be skeptical of new crops. I guess I'm not sure which crop he's talking about or whether it's all three, but certainly that's why it really pays uh, to put in, use these online tools for budgets and put in your own information. And that's why I looked at three or four sources for as many as I could for these because Obviously, there's some big differences in these budgets, even done by universities and so forth. So, uh, and that's why you start small also and talk to as many other growers as you can 
to get the bottom line on how they view it. And that's why I put contact information for these growers when <laughs> I'm volunteering them. So uh, you can make a uh, really educated decision on these. But um, if I had to rank, Hascaps and Saskatoons are right up there with the good potential with elderberries questionable. Yep, and that's what Chuck mentioned. He followed up and said, specifically, I've heard skepticism about elderberries mostly, so. Yep, yeah, that would follow true. <laughs> Okay, and we have a comment here from Bridget. Wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for attending. And thank you everyone else for attending as well. If there are no more questions. I'll wait a second here. Nobody see some people hopping off. Um, I think that is it. So again, uh, Brian, thank you so much for sharing this information with us today. Thank you, everybody, and good luck. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. <laughs>